Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Derek Armstrong. I am the Asset Protection Manager at the Swan Valley Co-op. And uh, one of the things we had done some time ago was uh, look at doing a, a presentation. And uh, that presentation was going to be involving uh, Myrtle Bilo and Shauna Zengerly. And uh, I'd like to just give a little bit of a preamble as to the, the events of the afternoon. Uh, we have roughly about an hour and uh, what we're looking for uh, today is everyone to be able to hear uh, a story and uh, I guess what I'd like to do is be able to share a little bit with uh, with you folks about how this came to be. Uh, the business consortium slash task force has been working on several different models uh, of uh, interaction within the community and we've got some great interagency folks that participate within it as well. And uh, I'd like to say that uh, the Swan Valley Co-op has been, been really, really supportive of, of the work we've been doing within the community, as well as many, many other businesses. Um, it's no secret that there's been issues in the community for a number of years. And this is kind of how Shauna and I have uh, gotten to know each other. And I'd like to just share a little bit of that before we, we go too much further. And uh, once I'm done uh, speaking to the preamble, I'm going to turn the the uh, mic over to Myrtle and she's going to share a little bit and then of course Shauna will also share a little bit today. So I am recording this uh, for the members uh, and participants that can't be here uh, within the task force and other community members. Um, so uh, again, this is basically uh, an opportunity for them to share their story. So it would be probably two and a half years ago uh, where uh, we'd had an incident at our gas bar and uh, and that caused, uh, I guess, an opportunity, a great opportunity for us within the task force uh, to take a look at, at some of the things we were doing and how to better, better support some of the folks that we were working with, as well as our, our, our team. Um, during that, I got to know Constable Mark Steinwald very, very well. Uh, we've got a great relationship with them, the members of the RCMP here locally as well. And, and um, Constable Steinwald was a, a huge uh, factor in making some of these things happen. Um, and I, I guess what I'd like to do is just share a little bit that um, the, the incident that occurred uh, had involved Sean and a few other folks uh, out there. And it was basically a check fraud incident. And uh, that being said, um, Shauna was great because uh, after I ended up reaching out to her uh, via Constable Steinwatt, we ended up having, uh, I guess, some wonderful opportunities to talk and Shauna to, to commit to restitution and working through a process with us. So within the task force, we're looking at different, different opportunities for people. Some of those opportunities are, uh, you know, working through Jesse, Stacy, and some of the other folks in the interagency of Meet Off Maine, uh, our second chance employment uh, aspect and group where we want to, to try and, and re-employ people who have opportunity. And then, of course, our restorative justice program and tier one housing. So we took a look at this and, and thought there, there's a good opportunity here to, to work with Shauna. And... Um, and it was, I won't, I won't lie, it was a little bit of a challenge uh, over the first year, year and a half. Uh, and Shauna can explain, you know, some of the things that she was dealing with. But we never wanted to take our foot off the gas. And we wanted to make sure that she understood that we were here uh, and wanted something better and greater for her in the future. And again, I must say that uh, working with Constable Steinwatt and Sergeant Hanson has been, has been really good throughout the, the process. Um, that being said, um, we offered Shauna some work. And uh, she was uh, looking to pay restitution through work hours. Uh, however, with things that have occurred during the course of that, that time in her life, it was challenging. And from there, what ended up happening is uh, Shauna was able to pick away at, at her debt, was able to work through that. And I'm proud to say that um, she's, she's been a marvelous, uh, I guess, proponent of restorative justice all the way through this. And uh, Mark, myself, uh, the team here have been extremely pleased and happy and really, really proud of her at the end of the day. Uh, I, I've almost come to, to look at her as almost an honorary niece at this point. It's kind of <laughs> it's kind of cool. So um, with that being said, um, I've also had the opportunity now over the last six months to be able to chat a lot with, with Myrtle. And I've really come to admire some of the some of the history and the challenges and, uh, and what you have to present to us today. Mm -hmm. So with that being said, I welcome everybody to the conversation and uh, 
thank you very much to both of you for doing this. I know it's not an easy thing, uh, but I understand also it's kind of a journey for you and a, and a road to, to be taken. Easy passy. So, I'm going to be quiet now and, and let you, you speak more when you can share your story and then we'll, we'll turn it over to Shona. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Myrtle Bio. I'm a mother of five, and uh, I'm a grandmother and a great grandmother. I'm happy to be here today to, to talk about my life and my children and my grandchildren. I've been sober 35 years. I have been February 2022. I didn't raise my children due to alcoholism. My mom raised my, my oldest and my youngest, and I had Shauna. We raised Shauna, me and my husband. It was a struggle at first when we first started living together because of alcoholism. But I'm glad to say that I with the help of my husband that we did pull through 25 years of sobriety. And another one thing I want to talk about is living my daily life without my daughter for so many years. She was into addiction. I prayed every night, every day. Sometimes I'd cry for a walk and cry and ask for her return to be safe that she had eaten that day. Many times she called and I would pray with her on the phone. I cry with her. But today to see her right here, my heart is happy. We're all happy. To see her come home, just about a, he a year now. Her dad must have talked to her in the hospital when my husband, her dad was in the hospital. And she's dying of cancer and something must have clicked. He must have said something to her because he knew he was going to go leave us and he, she did spend time with her dad at the hospital and something must have, he must have said something to her because she come home. I had to make a trip to go pick her up. Was that ever a good feeling? I never gave up on her. And I never gave up on, on whatever she did, I never gave up on her. I've always told her, I love you, you come home anytime. My husband and I used to talk about it and say, uh, Shona should come home, we need her. And we should talk to her and say, one of these days, mom, I'll make it home. One of these days, I'll come home. And today she's sitting here, my girl. That's the way to handle children with addiction. The parents, the grandparents, the grandfathers, do not give up on her child, do not give up on them because they have their own mind. They have their own mind when they're going to do what is good for them for a good life. I experienced my, my two kids talking to me that way. They said, I'll come home one of these days when I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna do it and don't give up on them. Do not give up on them because when you start giving up on your children, if you start preaching them and talking to them, you're not doing this. You can't be living that way. You're pushing them more further, further away from you. You got to tell them from the heart, from the heart that they can do it and tell them, I love you. That's the most important part is tell your children when you have addiction or or alcoholism, but tell your children regardless of what day is it, how much, what shape they're in, like if they're drinking or there, I tell them, I, I love you, give them a hug. That's the best thing they'll, that's the best thing they'll ever get is a hug and 
to know that the parents still loved him. Today, we share lots. Me and my daughter share lots. We talk lots. We laugh lots. We travel together. She travels with me to my meetings because I go with my job. I go to a lot of conferences and meetings. And she travels with me. And I really, really enjoy that. We get together as a family, have dinners, have big, big suppers at home or at my daughter's. And she's very helpful, very helpful at home. She's the strongest one there. I think there's a lot of lifting, a lot of exercising. I love that. I really, really thank God for bringing her home. And today, I, I went away six days. As soon as I seen her and I walked in, in this room, she just grabbed me and said, I miss you, mom. I miss you. I was away five, six days. And I told her I miss her too. I, re I didn't miss you, but we had contact. So I'm telling her, I'm saying this on behalf of myself and my family. <laughs> If you have a child, if you know anybody who has a child that's on the street, don't ignore them. Take time when you see them, talk to them, give them a hug. Feed them. Take them to a restaurant, feed them. And they feel that love. Even though he, some parents, they want to say something to them, give, give them a lecture, argue with them. That's not going to help. It's not going to help because you're pushing, like I said earlier, you're pushing them away further and further from you. They need to hear this. They need to know that they're still loved, even though they're doing what they're doing. I do have a son, my youngest child. He's still on the street. But we don't give up on him. He did come home one time, two days, and uh, her, she talks to her brother. Shona talks to her many times. He did come home two days, but he couldn't do it more than two days. We still see him here. We still tell him we love him. He's been in safety leases. One of these days, mom, I'll come home. I want to be ready pretty soon. So that's the important part of uh, living with a child with addiction, don't give up. Don't give up with the grace of God, they'll come home. And I'm glad that Derek asked me to speak a little bit more about my life. Because I was an alcoholic, I started drinking when I was 14. And I had my first child when I was barely 20. And from there on, when I tasted alcohol at that time, I always wanted to go more, get more, get more. So that's the reason why my mom took over my kids. After eight years I was sober, I told my mom, she was in her bedroom, I stopped there to talk to her after work. I said, mom, I've been sober eight years. And she looked at me and said, oh, she said, that's good and free. That's good. I said, I want to thank you for looking after my children. I don't know how much I owe you. And she says, you don't owe me nothing. You put me on my, you don't owe, any, don't owe me anything, my girl. She says, my baby. She says, your children are, go, are okay. And I said, my turn to take over my children. And he says, no. He says, you leave, you leave them here with me. They're going to live with me here, he says. And I said, why? He says, well, they're used to living here, and you can take them any time. Take them home any time. So that's what I, I started doing, me and my husband. We pick them up weekends, and we go travel, we go camping, we take trips, and, and they were happy, and I was happy. My husband was happy, too, that we sobered up. It took a while for us to get used to sober life, but it got better and better and better each day. 
All those prayers that we drink would never come and visit us once after we sobered up. They all disappeared. But today, after we sobered up, we got lots of friends, sober friends. They hug us, they shake our hand. They don't ask us for money. <laughs> the sober people are good people to, to have contact with and be friends. I believe that if, when you want something done, you have to work hard on it. You gotta remind yourself when you're an alcoholic, when you stay sober, I don't want to go back to that life. I don't want to see my children crying for me. I don't want to see my fridge empty. Because when we, when I was drinking, my fridge was always had alcohol, not very much food. My husband too. He used to, we used to buy a little bit of groceries, just enough to look last us, but my fridge was always at alcohol. My ornaments was all kinds of different wine bottles, beer cans, beer bottles. That, those were my ornaments. I had a big china cabinet. Of course, I couldn't afford nice ornaments. But when we sobered up, they slowly came off the shelf. <laughs> and I just laugh about that. My husband told me, why are, you, why are you throwing out your decorations? I said, they don't look good anymore. I said, <laughs> they need to come off the China cabinet. <laughs> because you guys just, just look at them in different kinds of beer cards, beer bottles, you know. So I slowly took them off the shelf and I did it. Anybody can do it, but they got to have to have a mind to do it. And my husband used to talk to young people, especially their grandkids, his nieces, his nephews, and he used to tell them, he says, if you want to quit drinking, you have to look at look after number one. How can you look after number two? Number one is you. You gotta look after yourself before you can look after number one. And he's and I heard him so many times saying that. And that's right. You have to look after, like me, I looked after Myrtle. I couldn't look after my children because I was drinking. I go to work, uh, I go to work hangover, sometimes half cut because I didn't want to miss work. I couldn't look after my children until I looked after Myrtle. And that happened 35 years ago. I'm glad to sit here to tell a little bit of my story. No, and I'm, I'm sure one of you that's listening will carry a, carry that story to people with alcoholism that's struggling. <laughs> like I said, it's, it can be done, but you have to look after one person is you. Okay, thank you. I'll let Shauna speak a little bit. I'd like to see my name. I think everybody knows. Me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I know my, my, my drug addiction. <clears throat> it all started when I walked in, walked in the bedroom and I seen my brother shooting up. And he was sitting there and he had that needle in his arm. And then I just started crying because that was the first time I seen it. And I watched my brother chase that drug, chase that needle. And I wanted to know why. He was so crazy about this drug. And why he chased that needle? Why did he, why did he throw away everything for this drug? 
So I decided to follow him. Because <coughs> me and my brother were close at one time. And he was given up on everything and he already has given up on everything. So, so me and my brother were, we had a close bond and I wanted to help him. I wanted to get him out. And I tried to get him out, but you can't help him unless they want it. If he doesn't want it, then he's not, nobody can get him sober or clean off that drug. He has to want it. <coughs> and I got myself in fire. The father, get him to this drug. I'll be able to help him to pull him out. But it didn't work that way. And little did I know that this drug is going to be very addicting because all I wanted to do was try it. I just wanted to try it. I wanted to see what he was chasing, why he chased his drug so bad, and why he, he gave up his, his family, his job. So I followed my brother. I chased my brother around. They gave me that shot of this, that crystal meth. I wanted to, I wanted to feel what he felt when he was on his truck. And he wouldn't give it to me. I, I chased him for weeks and weeks. I wanted that, I wanted to have that shot of crystal meth just so I could be beside him. And then he finally, finally gave it to me. He said, here, he gave me that needle and he said, I'm not doing it for you. He said, you find someone else to. So I said, okay. So I went down somebody else and somebody gave me that shot. And right then and there, that first shot, it just made me feel so Alive, I guess you can say, more. Like, nothing can knock me down. Like, I was, like, un indestructible. That's how I felt. And I just felt it when they gave me that shot, and I just felt it in the back of my throat. I just had a cool feeling. And then I started coughing for me. And that's what chasing that drake is all about. It's that cool feeling you get in the back of your throat. And then you cough and then that's, that's the drake and you're chasing. That's why you call it chasing the drake. And I didn't know that this drug was gonna be a very, it was gonna be addicting because it took everything from me. It took my family, my house, all the people I trusted. I didn't trust me anymore. And I thought that if I if I gave up my kids for one year so I could follow my brother around and do what I wanted to do just so I could be beside him. Little did I know I just blinked and five years passed by. I didn't even realize that five years was gone. And I was still sitting and think today that how could five years have gone by so fast when I thought it was just one year. And I had nothing. I had nothing and I lost trust for my family. I lost trust for my friends. I lost my home. 
my kids got mad at me. And at the time when I was on drugs and I was high, I didn't give a shit. Because I drug just makes me feel negative. Everything is, everybody's against you and everybody doesn't want to be with you. Too. And you just feel like you belong there with them on the streets. Because they make, they make you feel more comfortable and more wanted than your family does. But it's all in your head. It's just in your head that when you come off the drugs, it takes a while for a negativity to go away. Because I felt that for a long time, that I didn't belong in my family. And when I had my house and I gave up my kids, I became friends with all the drug dealers in Swan River and the Paw, some in Brandon. And I was friends with all the drug dealers. I always bought my drugs for free because I was good friends with them. It was rarely when I had to pay for drugs because of my friendship with the drug dealers. <clears throat> and then when, when I was so deep into the drugs, my brother got, I don't know, he was mad at me. He didn't want to talk to me. He was talking about me and calling me a liar and a thief in which I wasn't. So that, that broke our bond that me and my brother had. And then I started to care less and less about him because the way he treated me. And he was mad because I was friends with all the drug dealers. And I was getting my drugs for free. And then my friends, and they would always come and give me drugs. And if I had drugs, I would share with them. <clears throat> I wasn't cheap with my drugs. I gave them a lady to tie to. And then when I lost my house, I kept my clothes at my sister's. But then I just walked the streets, stay up all night walking around because I don't want to go back home to my sisters. So I don't want my family to see me the way I was. To be all high. Because when you're all high, you're just steady looking around. And you're digging around. And I didn't like the way they looked at me when I was there. They knew I was high. They knew what I was doing. I guess you could say I was kind of homeless. Mm -hmm. That's why I walked around a lot because I didn't have anywhere else to go. Just from one drug house to the other drug house. And at these houses, I didn't want to overstay my welcome with them and get kicked out, so I slept on my own and walked around. A lot of times I walked around by myself because the other ones always wanted to go do crime or break in somewhere and I wasn't into that. So I just walked around all over Swan. Mostly, all, mostly by myself. Now I just am grateful I feel, feel better being known for drugs. And I think it was for my mom. I wanted to give up a long time ago. 
was my family, my nieces and my sister. And they made me feel like nothing. So I wanted to stay on drugs. I wanted to do it just like this tomorrow. But at the same time, this started fucking with my head. I was, on, I was addicted to crystal meth for five years, and that was my drug of choice. The odd time I would shoot up morphine, but I always preferred crystal meth. And then my shots were, went from a small dose to a bigger dose, and then this going for it every one to two hours shooting up. And I just wanted to feel and taste it in the back of my throat. That's what I wanted. And if I didn't get it after the first shot, then I would do another one right after. Sometimes I would do like six shots, one right after the other, just to get that, that cold feeling in the back of my throat. And at the same time, I had to learn to doctor myself, is what they call it, when we shoot ourselves up. Because I didn't trust anybody to do it for me. Because if they miss, then you know, you can injure yourself, you hurt yourself. So I learned how to doctor myself. I learned how to do it myself. And I have track marks going from right here. Oh, uh, they up my arm this way. That's where I shot myself a full time. And one vein going all the way up. And then I started shooting my, not myself, but someone else had shoot me on the neck. And I started shooting up on my neck. And I started shooting up on my ankles so that people wouldn't see my track marks. There's, I still have a lot of family out there. They're basically all my family, they're all related. And they're still doing it. I would report and just sit right down and talk to them. They would tell me they're proud of me. I would talk to them about quitting and about, you know, uh, like the like better with our clothes. Okay, well, I just pray every day for my brothers to come back and be a little bit. Because <laughs> Christian Mike is messing with Jay, especially when you come out. For me, I, when, I, when I put drugs, I didn't wish myself off it, I just quit. So, that messed with my head a lot. <clears throat> I heard voices. Not just one voice, probably sometimes 20 voices. People talking to me, and there was nobody around. So at first, it scared me. I was scared when I first heard it. I couldn't sleep. I had to sleep with the light on. And I would listen to loud music all, all night. So I could drown with his voices. And it scared me. I was scared because I really thought that it wouldn't go away. I would be stuck with hearing these voices for the rest of my life. <laughs> and I didn't want that. I didn't want to hear voices anymore. But with each passing day, of course, I hear less and less of the voices. I don't hear them as much as I used to. And I was scared of the dark because I was scared of shadows. That shadows were going to get me. And then sometimes I it still 
scares me. Leaning dark, leaning in dark. But I never saw that in my head, so I'm trying like that. Incomodic. I get a lot of anxiety and panic attacks. I am alone too long. Because if I'm alone and I start thinking too much, and then it's like the voices come back. And then it scared me, I had panic attacks. I don't like to be alone too long. And I don't like to work. And I used to walk around in Swan. I used to walk around in the dark by myself. And I wasn't scared of today now. I'm scared of it. I sleep in between my boys and I'm their mom. That's how scared I am. So. <laughs> I just want to remind us we left all about drugs. I don't want it to go back to that life anymore because it's it's not a good life. It's not, it's not I don't know. It's like the time you're on, you don't see the one away. You don't see, you don't see like you can come off of it. Do you? It's going to be difficult and hard. Of course, it's going to be difficult and hard to come off. Drugs, but it's a lot of these people that I know that are on drugs, they don't have the same support I have. And I think that's one of the main reasons why I didn't quit or I didn't try because of the support system that I didn't have. And I'm thankful for my mom for being there and helping me. I am thankful for you for and Mark for encouraging me and trying this. And we had to I like coming here and talking to you because it keeps me motivated to keep going and not relapsing. I like hearing that people are proud of me because it's hard. It's hard to just be like, no, I'm not going to do it. But when you see the people walking around, you see that. We're so proud. for all the positive people that are there for me and I just want to be myself again. I want to do things that a normal person would do. Not be on the streets, looking on the ground, looking through the garbage, or doing stuff like that. I'm not like anyone I've done, I've dug through the garbage while I was on high on drugs. Because that's just part of being on drugs, because you're digging around, you want to dig around it. And I'm not ashamed to say it that I did that because that is what I did and that's part of me. Um, I'm not ashamed to say that I was homeless in the streets, that I slept in once in a while in the blue recycling bins where the paper is because I had nowhere else to go. Um,
I could have died one time because I fell asleep in the blue recycling bin and the garbage truck came. And I'm a heavy sleeper. Nice. All I learned was be, be, be. And I jumped up in that truck because I was waiting for to load up that truck. What you did. So I'm grateful for every day. And I wake up. I thank God. Because without him, I've never been here. And I just hope that a lot of these people that still do drugs that I, that I know, I hope they finally can reach out to somebody and get the help that they need. Because there is a better life than doing drugs and drinking. Because I was an alcoholic too before I drank. I drank for 17 days, one time straight. But now today, I don't even want to look at alcohol because I don't see no point in it anymore. I don't see no point in, in drugs. It just, it doesn't do nothing good for you anyways. It just takes away things from you slowly. Pretty soon you won't even know yourself, take your life away. I want to live I want to go old. I want to see my kids graduate. I want to see my grandkids. And that is why I choose not to go back to drugs. Because I want to live. I don't want to die so you want to, you know, one day overdose. One day stick that needle in my arm wrong. No. I want to be able to live for tomorrow. I want to live for today. I want to be happy. I don't want to be full of negative thoughts all the time. I'm done. Now it's my turn. After that, there's not a lot left to say. Thank you so much. And there's a lot of people here today that have a lot of vested interest in, in some of the changes within the community and certainly with you, Shona. Um, I was so happy to see Leon come down. Um, it's a great story. It's a wonderful opportunity for others to hear and to make changes in their own lives. So thank you very much. And I, I really, really humbly appreciate you sharing your story. And uh, I'd like to thank everybody else for participating today as well and, and listening and taking and walking away with this. Mm -hmm. And the good things that you've done that have come out of this, we get to hear, right? Spending time with your kids and your grandkids and, you know, looking forward to the day's events and being able to come into town. And I, I won't lie, when, when Shauna texts me and says, hey, we're coming to town, I get excited. <laughs> so thank you both very, very much. And with that, we'll sign off from the group. And please reach out and support anybody that you can participate in the harm reduction network and with the interagency groups. Thank you very much. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you.